So first, a uh, <coughs> couple of warnings. I have a bit of a cold, so hopefully we can get through this without too much sneezing. And uh, also, this is about Android security architecture. There's nothing groundbreaking here. here. It's probably stuff you, you already know if you're doing research. Hopefully, there is a couple of new things in, introduced in the uh, newest version, <coughs> which uh, I've tried to incorporate. But uh, this is mostly basic stuff. And there is also a lot of it, so hopefully we have enough time. <coughs> so the basic things I'm going to try to cover is uh, Android's architecture, security model, of course, how package management works, applications, and uh, how they're installed, permissions. Of course, everybody's talking about permissions because there's been big changes in the upcoming 6.2 release. SC Linux, which is also a kind of a new, relatively new addition to the Android security model. User management is it's been something uh, <coughs> which has been around for a while, but kind of overlooked. But it got a big, a big facelift in Android 5, so I'm trying to cover that as well. Also briefly uh, about uh, cryptography, PKI, credential storage, those are very, very broad topics, but uh, I'll just try to cover the basics. Uh, enterprise security and Android for work, those are things uh, which were introduced in the 5.0 release, I believe. A lot of changes there, hopefully we can cover the basic stuff. Device security and verified boot, uh, this is it's been a lot of work going in this area, but it's been mostly behind the scenes. And we finally have some, uh, you know, official documentation about it. So it's uh, also a very exciting topic, but also very extensive. So hopefully we can get through the basics. And um, finally, NFC secure elements, which is not really part of the core security architecture, but it's important because uh, it, uh, covers how, how you can access secure elements, which is uh, something uh, very, very <coughs> interesting research topic and uh, also an important topic for uh, our hosts. So first, Android's architecture is a variant of, of this diagram you've probably already seen. It's maybe every, everyone has it slightly different. Uh, starting from the bottom up, of course, we have the Linux kernel. Android is based on Linux, and uh, all of uh, most of the security <coughs> security measures and uh, isolation, up isolation is based on Linux. Uh, but of course, once you start going up the stack, it gets very different for a traditional Linux, uh, you know, server or embedded device. On top of it, of, uh, on top of the kernel, you have. Uh, native services, starting, of course, with init, which is, uh, again, very different from the init you see on a desktop on embedded devices. You have, of course, native daemons, native libraries, the hardware section layer, which is kind of the glue between the kernel and the, and the Android services. On top of that is the Android runtime, uh, originally Dalvik, now it's R. And, uh, from there up is actually the, the core of Android, which is a whole number of system services which uh, cooperate together. And I guess you could say that, uh, you know, Android service is a kind of big uh, build and object oriented system on top of the, on top of the Android kernel. And uh, of course, on top of that, the Android framework libraries, which uh, applications used to uh, communicate with the layers below. And of course, at the very top is uh, applications. There's this division between uh, user installed application and system applications. Because system applications have traditionally been given, you know, more privileges, mostly because they are on the system partition, therefore they can be trusted. This has been changing lately, maybe starting with 4.4. Maybe we should now talk, <coughs> instead of system application, about privileged applications, because system applications are, are not equal. Nowadays, we have system applications which live on the system, 
partition, but not really highly privileged, and also privileged applications which can get extra permissions. <coughs> so this is the basic architecture. But of course, on a modern device, it looks more like this. On one side, you have the Android device, which is what we talked about, and there is also additional secure OS or trusted OS, which is sometimes called, <coughs> which is completely different. Uh, it is isolated from the main OS, so the idea, of course, being that even if the uh, main OS gets compromised, what is stored in the secure OS or the services the secure OS provides, they remain secure. There's uh, different ways to implement it. Uh, you can be on a you know, dedicated chip, it could be virtualization, but uh, on most ARM devices, it's based on trust zone, which is uh, an ARM feature which uh, allows code running on, on, the, on the same hardware to switch between a normal world and a so-called secure world. Also, the memory is isolated, so uh, the normal world, what is um, stored in the normal world's memory and what is stored in the secure world's memory are separate. And the normal world, there is no way to directly access what is in the, in the secure world. <coughs> what is what this secure OS or trusted OS is mostly used for. Traditionally, it has been DRM, and uh, since the last few versions, we, we also have Keystore, which is basically a secure storage for keys, and, uh, they are, and, it, and there is an official API accessible to application, which we'll cover in a while. And of course, this being a secure OS, it is still basically a bunch of C code, and there have been, and probably there will be other uh, <coughs> vulnerabilities and ways to export it. Hopefully we'll hear more about it tomorrow from both sides. Uh, and again, this, this, uh, this particular diagram is, part for, is uh, taken from the Android for Work Security white paper, which even though it says Android for work is a nice introduction to Android's security model and architecture, so you should definitely look at it if you haven't. So based on this, what, is, what are the basic uh, points of Android security model? Uh, we have the application sandbox, which is again, based on the kernel. Uh, it is implemented uh, <coughs> by using separate, uh, traditionally, separate uh, user IDs and group IDs to isolate applications and their data, which is, of course, the uh, Linux's discretionary access control. And it has been uh, augmented recently, since starting since 4.4, .4, with uh, SE Linux mandatory access policy based control based on SE Linux type, type enforcement. Of course, uh, those applications are isolated, but they wouldn't be particularly useful if they were completely isolated from each other. So you have secure IPC. Different ways to communicate between applications and processes are also integrate some security features. The easiest, I mean, probably the basic one is uh, using uh, local sockets or Unix domain sockets. And of course, we have Binder, which is probably one of the central features of Android that sets it apart from other Linux-based uh, uh, systems. And of course, intents between, for communication between <coughs> applications, they also have incorporate some security features in there. Uh, as we saw in the first slide, there is a lot of uh, native code below all of the framework and the system services. Android uh, has been evolving in the direction of trying to drop all the privileges which are not strictly needed. So most of the uh, native services, they uh, try to use Unix capabilities, uh, Linux capabilities, and drop all the capabilities which they are not needing. Uh, of course, we have code signing. Code signing here is uh, quite different from what we have, let's say, on iOS where you cannot execute any code if it's been signed. 
Uh, there is no uh, code sizing for native code per se. It's only for application packages and uh, OS updates. We'll look into detail in a bit. Uh, of course, Android permissions. Uh, we have system and custom permissions which are required to access uh, anything from system resources, hardware to personal information, and of course, uh, application components from, from other applications. So starting on uh, with Binder. Binder is an IPC which is based in the kernel. Uh, it, it's very core, it's actually quite, uh, quite small, but still multi-multi-feature. Uh, it provides different services. If you can read through it if, if you're interested, it's probably uh, a good exercise. But what is important here that uh, when you have two processes which are communicated, uh, the communication goes through the kernel. So there is, uh, you know, barring any, any vulnerabilities or errors, there is no way for a process A to fake its identity and try to get a higher privilege than it has because um, the, the process identity, the process ID and uh, effect, effective user ID, they, they are filled out by the binder driver. So as long as you can trust the kernel, you can be pretty sure that binder IPC is secure. Another important aspect of how uh, the sandbox is implemented is how packages are installed. So if we look at it in a bit more detail, we have an Android package, APK file is basically a zip file. It has a, a bunch of uh, predefined files in it. Most importantly, an Android manifest, which uh, stores anything from permission to components uh, uh, declarations. Of course, you have classes dex, which is the main code, uh, the compiled uh, code of the application. You have, if you're using native libraries, you might have uh, library files in there, maybe multiple, multiple files per uh, supported platform. And of course, there is a meta inf directory, which stores the signature and it, it comes from uh, jar signing which is uh, kind of the basis of uh, APK signing. So when, uh, when uh, a package is installed, it basically gets split into two parts, code and resources and data. And the code and resources are common for all users. <coughs> Where they installed is very slightly by version by in the latest Android point, uh, latest, uh, M preview three, uh, it goes into data app and uh, where com example app is the package name. Uh, inside it, you have the native code. I uh, have uh, a file called base o ODX, which is the uh, compiled classes dex. If you're using art, it will be uh, a native code. And of course you have base APK, even though the the APK is a zip file. It doesn't. It doesn't get exploded on the on the file system. And basically, all resources and internal data they are uh, they are accessed by memory mapping the base APK. And on the on the other hand, you have uh, data, which is uh, dedicated uh, dedicated directories for the apps data. You have. Uh, if you have a single user, uh, the application data directory will be under data user zero, where zero is the first uh, owner user. And again, the application package name and different, different directories for the application's uh, files, databases, and whatnot. If you have multiple users, you will have, uh, actually this is, this should probably will be 10, not one, because the first secondary user gets the uh, user ID 10, but uh, you will have uh, similar similar, similar uh, directory structure for, for other users. And if we look inside into the data directory, we, what we see is that uh, <coughs> there are mul multiple multiple directories, each for the installed application. And the important uh, 
thing to note here, is, which I've tried to highlight, is that each uh, directory has a user, a separate user and group. Uh, in this example, this is for the user zero, so you have u zero and a1, a5, and a27, or whatever, which is the application ID. <coughs> so this effectively achieves part of the application sandboxing, where each uh, application has their own dedicated data directory. And if you look at the permissions in there, you'll see that uh, because the user, uh, the user and the group are the same, the uh, <coughs> application can access its own files, of course, but it's not available to for uh, other applications which are running as a different user and directory. And of course you have some built-in uh, built UIDs like Bluetooth system and radio. Or probably the most important is system because a, a lot of services are running as a system user. So it, it comes up multiple times. Uh, basically any, any ser system service which is running as system can they could share files. But of course, <coughs> if you look at the fourth column, which is the uh, security context, the AC Linux security context of each directory, uh, you can see that uh, besides the user uh, and group, each uh, directory has uh, a dedicated, uh, dedicated AC Linux type for uh, user install applications, uh, you can see that it's all up, up data file, but for, for system and radio and Bluetooth, it's uh, basically a, uh, uh, an AC Linux type which is kind of maps the, the uh, user dot those services are executing as like system radio, etc. We'll, we'll go into uh, a bit more detail in the AC Linux part. So package management is actually quite complicated. If you want to look into it, if you have a spare month, you can read through package manager services Java. But uh, package manager is kind of the central component and then you have uh, different installer mount service, media container service, which uh, take care of uh, creating, creating directories, uh, creating uh, encrypted containers, decrypting, encrypted application, etc. One one interesting fact is that uh, you probably know it, but uh, you can install application not just going through the you know ADB install or the package manager. You can also install application by just dropping them in the system app and uh, data app directories. And the package manager is monitoring the, those directories so it will automatically scan them and install them uh, once they are dropped in there. Not 100% sure how this works on Android M because I haven't, I haven't had the chance to try it, but that's how it works on previous versions. So, package management, of course, has a lot more features. Uh, one interesting uh, feature is how system apps are updated because as we said in the beginning, system apps, they live in the system partition which is read-only. So how do you update them? Do you remount uh, read-only? Do you whatever you do? So there are different ways to do this. Uh, if you update through the Play Store, the system apps are, uh, the updates are installed in the data partition and the package managers do some. Uh, internal switching to switch to the newer version. If you update to the OTA file, it's a slightly different story. And uh, of course, the, you can have a situation where the updated, fi updated file is with a different signature, so there's a bunch of tricky, tricky code that handles this part. Uh, also, <coughs> Android supports encrypted packages, I believe since 4.2, not sure if they are still uh, used that much, but uh, the idea is that uh, for pet applications, the application comes encrypted from the Play Store and it's end-to-end -end encrypted to your device. There's also forward-looking, which is a 
uh, basically a DRM system for paid apps. What it does is it installs uh, applications, paid application in an encrypting container, and what it does uh, in addition is it further splits an application into code and public resources. So there is actually three parts to our application, the data, code, and public resources. So there's a lot of uh, tricky stuff in there as well. Package verification, something which you may have come across if you've seen this warning. It's been around since, I believe, ICS 4.0, but uh, it only started uh, being uh, used maybe since 4.2, I believe, and then it's been backported to other versions. But uh, the idea here is that you have uh, verification agents which basically can uh, stop the installation of uh, a package. So you say install these applications and uh, this application, and in order to actually install it, you have to uh, get uh, those uh, verification agents, there could be multiple, uh, to agree that it's actually okay to install this application. If you are writing your own Android version or uh, you know custom ROM, you can of course write your own verification agent. But uh, on most devices, the default uh, agent is in, maybe nowadays in, in Google Play services, but originally it was in, in Google Play Store, integrated into the Google Play Store application. And what it does is basically every time you install applica an application, an APK, I think the first time you do it, you actually get a well, dialog which asks you to agree to it. But uh, it uh, sends, it analyzes the application, it sends, <coughs> sends details to Google, like signature, uh, I believe the hash of the classes DEX and the hash of the Android XML and maybe other stuff. This is uh, all, of course, changing. So uh, there might be more things in there. And if the Google Google's database uh, decides that this is a harmful application, you'll get this dialogue. Uh, going on next, code signing is also uh, closely related to application packages. Uh, there's two, three types, main types of code signing. First one is, of course, application packages. Uh, <coughs> APKs, they are signed with X540Q uh, certificates. Generally self-signed, but they don't have to be, but actually as Android doesn't really care much. Uh, treat it as binary blobs. What it means is that Android doesn't really care what's in the certificate. It doesn't care what extensions it has. It doesn't care what's your name and email address or whatever. So in this sense, uh, uh, call signing is using PKI technologies, but it's not actually PKI. So there's a lot of uh, there's been a lot of confusion about this. What do you do when certificate expires? Do you check? Uh, for uh, revocation and things like this. Uh, up till now, Android really doesn't care. Another interesting, uh, I think important fact is that uh, because APK, is, uh, APK code signing, it comes from jar signing. When you say that APK file is signed, it doesn't mean that you have one signature for a particular APK file. What it means is that you have multiple signatures for, for all the files which are in the APK. Uh, so, uh, the signing certificate is the, is the package identity. It's used for a lot of things, uh, mainly for getting signature permissions and to making sure that uh, an update is coming from, from the same place as the original file. Uh, what else? It's also used for shared user ID, which allows uh, multiple multiple packages to run as the same user and optionally with the same uh, with the same process. Uh, update packages OTAs they are also zip files, but they are not using jar signing. Here the signature is over the, f the whole file. It doesn't care what's the, the actual files inside, and it has been uh, I don't know. <laughs> Hack to, to fit in the zip command. So this is a zip file has a, like a string command which actually hosts the 
uh, signature. It's verified by the OS and the recovery image. So it's two times. Uh, one time when it's downloaded and one time before actually installing it. And uh, one other new thing uh, is that system images may also be signed. This is being like platform dependent or vendor dependent. Now I think it's uh, required, at least the uh, um, current build system signs it and, uh, and the bootload bootloader does check at least uh, uh, the boot partition. A very quick example, if you look in the APK file, there is in the meta inf uh, directory two files. One is shared S, which is the signature manifest, and uh, SART RSA is the actual signature. So the signature, uh, <coughs> the signatures are signatures of the of the uh, entries in the ma in the manifest file. So you have multiple of those, and uh, every one of them can be signed with a different certificate, which has been a problem. Uh, and uh, of course, you can uh, you could have. Uh, multiple files, you could have two classes DEX, which is uh, the basis of the so-called master key exploit. Nowadays, uh, Android uses a uh, so-called strict jar verifier, which makes sure that there are no du duplicate files and that all the, all the certificates are actually the same, which is very important for Android because for, as we said, uh, the signing certificate is kind of the identity of the package, and when you have many of them, which one is the real one? So it's very important to make sure that all of them are signed with the same uh, same uh, certificate. So going on to permissions, uh, there's many, uh, some academic papers have been published trying to identify what exactly Android permissions are. I don't think then there is any clear consensus, but basically it's a, a ability to perform a particular operation. Could be regarded as a form of a Mac because it's enforced by the uh, implicit kind of system policy. Uh, permissions are enforced at different levels. At the kernel level, which is uh, most uh, interesting, I think basic, or maybe the only one <laughs> example is the internet permission, which is uh, the so-called par paranoid network security patch to the kernel, which doesn't allow you to uh, use sockets if you're not a member of the internet group. A native service level where which, of course, native services don't, don't, don't know nothing about permissions, but um, permissions could be mapped to, to groups, to supplementary group IDs, so they check for those. Uh, framework level, you have, uh, you know, dynamic or imperative checking where the mainly system services, they actually check if the UAD calling them over binder has a particular permission. And there is a more declarative or static approach which everyone is using is, uh, of course, uh, <coughs> services and uh, intent, uh, content providers, they declare what permissions uh, they require in the Android manifest file and uh, when you try to call them, Activity manager and package manager do the actual checking for you. Uh, permissions traditionally have been uh, assigned at install time, of course. Uh, the big change to Android 6, there is also runtime assignment and also revocation. Uh, permissions have different protection levels. Uh, those haven't changed much since the beginning. There's the normal, which is basically always granted. There's the dangerous, which uh, previously required user uh, user confirmation at install time. Now it's at runtime. Signature permissions, of course, require you to be signed with the uh, same same certificate as the as the application that declared the permission. And there's sort of a compromise <laughs> signature or system, which uh, kind of allows you to get a signature permission if you're signed with the same certificate or you live in the system partition. Nowadays, it's more of a, a signature or privilege. You have to be a privileged app to get the permission. Uh, of course, you have system permissions. Those are in the Android package defined in framework, REST, APK. Uh, system signature permissions are, yeah, if you want to get those, you have to be signed with the platform certificate. Custom permissions defined by applications they are 
not so useful because there have been different problems in there, like what's the order of permissions? Can you redefine the permissions? I think the latest version requires you to, to hold the same signature uh, certificate in order to redefine a permission, but there have been some problems in there. Not 100% sure how it works with uh, Android M. As we said, share ID where you can uh, run with the same user ID as, different, as another package if you're signed with the same certificate. The interesting thing here is that uh, all packages part of a shared user ID get all the permissions that have been declared. So if you have application A with permission one, application B with permission two, and application C with permission three, install all of them, each of them will have permission one, two, and three. And permission groups, they have been there I believe also since the beginning, but have been largely underused. Uh, they group related permissions and are quite important for Android M. Uh, quick review, install permissions, install time permissions, all permissions granted in install time, dangerous permissions require user confirmation, so this is dialogue. Uh, no runtime checks required once you install an application, you can be sure it has all the permissions you have requested cannot be revoked except for some development permissions. Permission, uh, install time permissions are quite fine grain. There's like lots of them. And uh, if you remember all our version of Android would list all of them in one big list. Another thing, uh, they are granted for all users. So if user one uh, updates an application, uh, permissions key grants are also applied to user two, stored in packages, XML, of course. Runtime permission, everybody's talking about this, so just briefly, need to prompt for dangerous permissions, can be revoked at any time. They are granted by permission group, so if you uh, request, for example, the read contacts, the next time you request uh, write contacts, you wouldn't get this dialogue because they are in the same permission group. Another important change is that uh, runtime permissions, unlike install time permissions, they are managed per app and per user. So if two users install this application, one user can allow the application to use the camera, the other one might deny it. Of course, permissions can be revoked, but some cannot be. Uh, this is governed by the uh, device policy, which you can set with device policy manager, so basically, the toggle will be disabled or not shown at all. And uh, next is SLinux, which is like a huge, huge topic, so we'll just try to go over the basics. Uh, SLinux is uh, it's actually many things. It has many different features, but the way it's Android, uh, used in Android is mostly as a mandatory access control via type enforcement. SLinux is actually just one of the uh, security modules that can be used in the Linux kernel. Uh, it could be, you know, AppArmor and others as well. At the very, uh, the very, very core, it's quite basic. You have subjects and objects. When a subject tries to access uh, objects, you check the policy to see whether to allow it. A subject is usually a process. An object is a file, socket, whatever. So when you try to access it in the usual Discretionary access control, you just look at the permissions. In the case of SE Linux, you go in the kernel through the object manager, security server, and you check the security policy. Once you have a security decision, it's cached for performance. But uh, this is basically what happens. And the most important part, of course, is the security policy. Everything else is just a framework which always stays the same. A very quick example from the key store uh, policy in Android. Uh, this is how a policy file looks. Basically, you define a domain for the key store daemon. This init daemon domain is a, a macro, which basically transitions the key store to this domain when it's first executed. And the bulk of the policy is those allow rules, which basically say that everything which is executes within the key store domain can, in this example, uh, create uh, directories within those uh, directories that have the key store data file 
type or, for example, connect to the sockets which have the key type. In Android, it has been modified in a number of ways. Binder support, of course, new init commands, labeling for system properties, which are very important for Android. Uh, labeling for application processes has been extended as well because the effort from Zygote and domain transition doesn't work as is. Uh, we have AC app context file. Middleware map is uh, basically a way uh, to assign labels based on the signing certificate. I think it's been it's getting trimmed down, and in the latest version, there's only only two labels for platform and all the rest. And of course, an alternative view of SE Linux is that. Uh, a very, very granular policy is not so useful if you can compromise the kernel, which takes care of SE Linux. So some people, of course, think that, uh, you know, developer time is better stay, uh, spent hardening the kernel. Multi-user support has been around since 4.2, originally for tablets, now for phones as well. Uh, users are isolated by UID, UID, each user gets a system directory and app directory. There is a way that the UID for each application for each user is being derived. Another important topic is uh, external storage isolation. External storage is usually uh, traditionally have been using the VFAT file system, which doesn't have permissions. So there is a lot of bind mounting and uh, but Linux uh, namespace is used to isolate external storage. Different type of users. Uh, originally, what yeah, Android had is just one user, primary user, owner, has full control over the device. Similar to root, but of course less control. Secondary users are just uh, additional users, which can be removed by the first user. You can see some of the warnings you get when you uh, set up a secondary user. Restricted profile is a user which is shares the application of the primary users, only for tablets. The new stuff uh, seems uh, 5.0 are managed profiles, which have separate apps and data, but share the UI with the primary user. So it's basically a different persona. For example, your corporate identity versus your private identity. A guest user, which is a temporary user, which can be deleted. We'll get uh, a bit more details about profiles in a bit. Cryptography and SSL, of course, in order to do secure communication and whatnot. You need this stuff. Uh, Linux, uh, Android, is based on the JCA provider architecture. It has multiple providers. Uh, the interesting ones are the GMS core open SSL, which can be dynamically updated by a play services at the Hadrid Key Store, which uh, uh, allows you to create unextrapable keys. SSL support is also based on the Java APIs. You have two providers. The main one is Android Open SSL, which uses native code. Certificates and PKI traditionally Hadrid uh, in the two. 2.0 and I think 3.0 it shipped with a hard coded trust store. Now it's user control. Uh, it's uh, managed per user and per profile. And the uh, important thing here is that uh, Android has enhanced certificate chain building. It can use dynamically updated blacklists and pinning. Network security, of course, you support WPA enterprise, different sorts of enterprise, uh, VPNs. Important thing for VPN is you can have per user VPNs and per application VPNs. Through the policy, you can uh, require that the data for partition of a particular application goes through a particular VPN. Credential storage is also a related topic. Uh, it's a system-managed secure cryptographic store which uh, allows you to create unexportable keys so you can generate them and use them but cannot see the actual key material. Uh, the idea is to remain secure even if the main OS is compromised. 
This is, of course, only uh, possible if you have some hardware backing. It's uh, in the key store system service. There is a HAL interface which uh, declares the interface for hardware backed implementation. Typically uses Rust. Uh, it has, of course, framework APIs, keychain API, key store API, key pair generator, key generator. Key generator is kind of important here because uh, in Android 6 Marshmallow, you can actually generate symmetric keys. Another less often discussed thing is online account management. You can get, uh, there is a system store for accounts, passwords, authentication tokens. All of this is managed through the account manager API, which has pluggable architecture, but it's not really so flexible. The interesting thing here is that this is actually kind of the f one of the first runtime permissions in Android because you have to uh, agree to use a token, allow this application to use this token for per application and per token. Google accounts, of course, are special. Once you initialize the device, uh, you enter the Google password only once, and then it stores a master token. You can control it to the uh, web UI, revoke and add access. And device administration has been uh, in Android since 2.2, I believe, but it hasn't been all that useful. It uh, got a lot of new features in 5.0. It allows you, now the terminology here gets a kind of confusing, but the uh, application is called a device administrator. It allows you to send different policies. It needs to be activated by the user and cannot be uninstalled, which is something a lot of power is using for persistence. Once you agree to this dialog, you cannot uninstall it before first disabling, so a lot of people have no idea that can, they can disable it. Uh, administrations, uh, device administration and policy might uh, be required to sync account data. For example, to get corporate, corporate data, you need to activate the administrator first. Uh, Android for Work builds on all of this by introducing a work profile, which is uh, as a, uh, a managed profile which shares the UI for, with the primary user but allows for different application. It follows a predefined profile, separates apps and data, of course. And you can have, as you can see here, the briefcase icon is the Android for Work. Uh, two versions of the same application. You can get uh, notifications with the same ID. Another thing, uh, related thing is on device owner, which is kind of a super device admin. It can only be installed when the device is uh, first initialized, when it's reset. It has extra privileges and is scoped to the whole device. Uh, one thing Android for work requires is of course device encryption, which has been there since 3.0, I believe. Uh, it's based on DMcrypt, it's block device encryption, which comes with the, all the problems and uh, advantages. You cannot have integrity, you uh, encrypt per block. Uh, it uses uh, AES with uh, by default 128 keys. The actual key is uh, encrypted with another key encryption key derived by the password in 5.0, optionally protected by a hardware key. Uh, a different, uh, you can, in 5.0 fi uh, and beyond, you can encrypt on first boot. And another interesting detail is there is been some support for file-based encryption. Hopefully in the next version we will see this. File-based encryption is in, uh, interesting because it allows, for example, different users or different applications to encrypt with different keys. Uh, device security, of course, traditionally, lock screen, uh, first only pattern, uh, then pin and password. Uh, up till 100M, it simply stored the hash of your pin and password. In 6, uh, Android 6, there is a gatekeeper HAL, which is a uh, hardware abstraction layer for storing uh, and enrolling uh, passwords and pins, so it can be hardware-backed and more secure. 
if the device supports it. Of course, since uh, 5.0, we have SmartLock, which is basically a brand name for trust agents, which are components which, uh, based on some environment factor, they can change the state of the device, locked or unlocked. It's extensible, it's pluggable. Uh, what we have, of course, you can write your own if you're using, uh, if you're writing uh, your own Android fork or uh, custom ROM. What we have now is Bluetooth, NFC, uh, face unlock, which are uh, proprietary Google code. Factory reset protection has been there since 5.1, I believe. What it does is saves Google account information on the FRP partition so that you have to enter your password in Google ID after you reset the device. Fingerprint, of course, is the big thing which everybody's talking about, but nobody has seen yet. Uh, there is a fingerprint hull which allows it to be protected by hardware, if available, of course. Can be used for payment authorization, even though the API there is very confusing, in my opinion. It requires you to create an encryption key tied to uh, authentication. So if you want to see if the user has authenticated in the past 10 minutes, you have to encrypt some data. And if, if, you, if uh, it decrypts successfully, you can assume that they have authenticated. It's probably going to cause many problems for developers. Verified boot is a very important topic. It's basically uh, <coughs> ensuring the software uh, integrity based on some hardware root of trust. This has been also very device dependent, but finally it's documented and Android, the latest preview kind of works according to this state diagram. Uh, the simplified boot chain is first, uh, you verify the bootloader with the hardware root of trust, then the bootloader boot loader verifies the boot partition, uh, we, and the kernel verifies the system partition. Device or bootloader state can be locked and unlocked. And according to this documentation there, you can use non-OEM keys. So basically, if you have a custom ROM, you can uh, install your own signature keys. Not sure if this works <laughs> quite yet with the latest preview, but uh, according to the documentation, it does. Uh, you have different boot, sta boot states. If uh, any of the partition is compromised, you get a warning. It works currently for the boot and system partition. Uh, you can get a red state. I haven't been able to reproduce the orange state, but uh, probably it also works or will work. Yeah, very it is a transparent integrity checking for block devices, originally used from, for Chrome OS. Uh, it's been integrated in Android since 4.4, I believe, but it's only been deployed recently. What it does is basically it generates uh, read errors if uh, block integrity fails. How it does it is you have the hashes of each block, and then you take hashes of hashes until you arrive at a root hash, which is signed, and it's appended at the end of the partition. Of course, this only works if the partition is read-only, like system, because uh, you cannot build the, the hash tree like at runtime. What, uh, in order for all of this to work, uh, one big change that has been introduced in Android is uh, block-based OTA updates. Prever the previously updates were applied by file, which of course would require you to regenerate the DM verity after the update and write it down complicates things a lot. Now it's done in uh, until since 5.0, I think, uh, all uh, updates are uh, block-based and least on Nexus. Of course, for all of this to work, to be useful, the kernel needs to be trusted because this works inside the kernel. So this is where verified boot comes in. Some changes in 6.0 and uh, basically the biggest change is that uh, all of this is now stateful. So you have two modes, enforcing and logging mode, and the uh, mode is stored in, the, in a dedicated metadata partition. Uh, the way it works, 
for which it's supposed to work is first time you boot, if there is a problem with the enforcing mode, you switch to logging mode and show the warning and allow the user to boot. It doesn't, it doesn't block the boot completely. So the user has, you know, the choice to either not use the device or use it in a potentially compromised state. And finally, very quickly, <laughs> NFC, secure elements. Uh, NFC has been there for a long time. There's reader writer mode, uh, P2P mode, and most importantly, card emulation mode, which has been uh, traditionally implemented with secure element since 4.4 also with host-based uh, card emulation, which basically allows a, an application to behave like a secure element which of course is lower security level, but much more flexible. Secure elements, you can have different forms and factors and sizes and whatnot. Of course, the SIM card is a secure element. Uh, you can have a micro SD, which includes a secure element. This ASDD uh, standard, I think, is mostly dead, but then again, we have Project Vault from Google, which is also a micro SD card. We might see some development there. Embedded SE, uh, which was, I think, in the original uh, Nexus S, uh, up till Nexus, the, the next two versions. There are different APIs, restricted telephony APIs, open mobile API, which uh, seeks to unify all of the different supported secure elements. And of course, the Android HC, which is uh, just a uh, application which uh, generates APDUs. I think I'm out of time, but this is it. References, official documentation has been updated, very, very uh, worth looking into. There's community wikis and stuff. Of course, mobile security companies publish a lot of interesting stuff. You should look into it. Some recently published books that could be useful, of course, they are out of date at the point they get published, but still uh, interesting, uh, useful to get the basics, I think. So that's, that's it. Probably look in there. <laughs> so, I was just like looking into our last meeting, and uh, um, most of the slides actually have the content you need to back it up with your article. So, it's good to look down on those slides and see the class of security screens we've been working with. Any questions? The way it works is uh, there's a required verifier and multiples of sufficient verifiers, I think. And the way it's now is uh, the one in Google Play is the required one. So basically, uh, even if you have multiple, if Google Play says OK, it's, it's considered OK. So even if the other ones, now, I haven't looked in the latest code, but I think if you use the Google Play, you, can, you cannot override it because it's the required one. If you want to use multiple, you have to use, uh, uh, you have to remove the required one and you have multiple sufficient verifiers in order to have, like for example, uh, getting data from two sources. If you want to do this, you have to think, uh, I think you have to use multiple uh, verifiers, but remove the Google one because it will override them. Uh, 
Well, uh, I think if uh, you are using like an engineering image, there is a command to disable it. But uh, basically, that's that's kind of the the hard part because uh, if you get an error, you cannot be sure if this is like a actual compromise or your device is you know starting to to break, like a physical damage. So there's not really much uh, you can do about it. Uh, you, uh, except go into logging mode and continue using it without, you know, log the errors similar to AC Linux. Just log the errors, but they keep up coming up. Maybe Nick can get <laughs> more detail. Uh, the question is, for DM Verity, of course, you get uh, read errors. If there is a problem, what can you do about it? One of the challenges with DM Verity is that um, hardware errors occur on Android devices occasionally. And so the question is, what do we do when a hardware error occurs? Um, traditionally, before verified boot, the system would continue on. It probably wouldn't even be no noticeable by the user. Maybe an image was corrupted, maybe there'd be some small corruption. Um, with verified boot, you have great security properties. You detect that there's a signature failure, and um, the kernel returns an I.O. error, and you can't access that. So is returning an I.O. error sufficient? Um, we're still trying to measure where we're at with verified boot, the level of corruption that we can expect on devices. But over time, I could see it going into a, a, a stronger enforcing mode where we actually do um, return I.O. errors or even just shut down the device. Any more questions? You mentioned uh, something about the, the Qualcomm Secure OS, right? That you have a parallel OS, uh, the Android, uh, the Linux OS, and the uh -huh. Qualcomm. And you mentioned that you can attack this uh, uh, Qualcomm OS, right? Mm. It's uh, not only Qualcomm, but yeah, it's uh, one of the major... Uh, wh what is uh, the attack vector for... Uh, uh, there is different stuff. I think there is a talk tomorrow about it, so you can hear more about it. And there is a few recent blog posts that say about it. But uh, basically, uh, I think they have um, tables they use to jump to call. And uh, you can, through a, like a kernel vulnerability, you can overwrite those tables. So you can jump to a different place, basically. Uh, I can give you the, the links. There is uh, this guy who wrote like a series of blog posts about the vulnerabilities he discovered. So basically, you go through the kernel and you overwrite some some <coughs> some memory in there. So okay. it's not easy. It's actually quite tricky to get it right, but it is possible. Thank you. There is going to be more detail on Trust Zone. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So then let's. Thank Nikolai again. <laughs>